colleagues in partnership with the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Nephrologie, the Österreichische Gesellschaft für Nephrologie and the Société Francophone de Nephrologie Dialyse Transplantation. Markus at home welcomes Professor Hume and Kamel in New York City, New York, and Professor Tobias Geisler in Tübingen, Germany, in order to discuss whether or not to give oral anticoagulation treatment in patients with embolic strokes of undetermined source or ESIS, based upon their Achidia and Attica study. Dear Dr. Geisler, dear Dr. Kamel, it's a pleasure to host the two PIs of two landmark studies in the field of anticoagulation. From my side also, thank you for joining. Um, as a brief introduction, uh, Professor Kamel is a neurologist and chief of the Division of Neurocritical Care and director of the Clinical and Translational Neuroscience Unit at the Department of Neurological at the Fail Family Brain and Mind Research Institute at Whale Cornell Medicine in New York City. And as already mentioned, he's PI of the Arcadia study, which compared apixaban to aspirin in subjects with ASUS with embolic stroke of unknown source and atrial cardiopathy. Professor Kamel is a, has a long-standing research record on the relationship between cardiac disease and stroke, and which is something that combines all of us here. Also, Professor Geisler, um, a cardiologist and a colleague from Tübingen in Germany, who is deputy director of the medical cardiology clinic there, heads the clinical study unit, um, has also been granted um, um, scholarship and, and uh, research funding by the DFG, the main German research funding organization. And he's PI of the Etica study, which compared apixaban and aspirin for embolic stroke of undetermined source. So both of you, Professor Kamel, Professor Geisler, thank you very much for joining. We're very happy to be also joined by Professor Kleinschnitz in Essen, um, important uh, stroke cardiologist, stroke neurologist in Germany. Thank you for coming and joining and discussing uh, the studies with us. First of all, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to further um, discuss the results um, of the Atticus trial. Uh, of course, in the context of the Arcadia trial together with uh, Homan Kamil. So these are my potential conflicts of interest. And I would like to highlight that uh, Atticus um, was an investigator initiated trial with support by the industry, namely the alliance of Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer and uh, also Medtronic. So first of all, the stroke classification of ESOS, which is symbolic stroke of undetermined source, is a construct where we actually don't know the etiology. So that's why it's called cryptogenic stroke in a previous toast uh, classification. It is principally a diagnosis of convenience after obvious thromboembolic causes have been excluded by a basic cardiovascular worker. But you can also see that there's a fluent and large overlap with the other stroke types, and possibly ASOS includes other etiologies like atherosclerotic disease with arterial, arterial embolic events. So therefore, it's reasonable to better refine the diagnosis of ASOS with regards to a true cardioembolic nature. As a background to Atticus and also Arcadia, Two previous trials have investigated the effects of DOAX, namely dabigatron and rivaroxaban in unselected ESOS cohorts, compared to aspirin therapy, there was no reduction of recurrent rates of stroke and systemic embolism under DOAX therapy in these trials. The hypothesis of Atticus was therefore that apixaban might reduce recurrent cerebral ischemia in an enriched ESOS population with additional risk factors for cardiac thromboembolism. Atrial fibrillation monitoring was mandatory throughout the trial to provide insights in prevalence and burden of AF and its association with recurrent ischemic strokes. Articles was a randomized, active controlled, open label, blinded endpoint, multi-center phase three trial involving 15 sites in Germany. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion after ESOS if they had at least one additional risk factor for cardiac embolism, that could be increased left atrial size, spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrial appendage, reduced LAA flow velocity, premature atrial contractions and long-term ECG, a Chatzva score of at least four, or a patent for Amorala. The primary endpoint were new ischemic lesions on diffusion, diffusion weight MRI at 12 months. According to ethical consideration, we had to implement a strategy to switch patients from aspirin to apixaban in case atrofibrillation episodes of more than two minutes were detected in readings of the implantable loop on, uh, recorder. 
So in total, 178 patients were assigned to the apixaban arm and 174 patients to the aspirin arm. These were included in the intention to treat analysis. An adaptive study design was used in the Atticus trial. The interim analysis took place after 200 patients were enrolled and 12 months follow-up was available. The recommendation to stop further enrollment was based on futility. However, no safety issues arose and thus continuation of study visits and therapy according to protocol was recommended in all remaining patients. Here are the baseline characteristics. You can see that age, gender, and risk factors were well balanced between the treatment groups according to the randomization process. Patients with a major stroke, meaning NIHS of five or more, could be enrolled a protocol, but actually were only a minority in the trial. You can see also the time in uh, index um, from index stroke to randomization was roughly a week. So we enrolled patients very early after the index stroke um, event. So the only distribution, um, uh, unbalanced distribution, was regarding the history of cancer and the patent of Ram Ovala, which appeared more frequent in the apixaban um, compared to the uh, aspirin arm. MRI at 12 months was available in about 92% of the patients. The reason why MRI could not be performed in 8% of the patients are listed below. The primary endpoint occurred in 13.6% in the apixaban arm and 16.0% in the aspirin arm without reaching statistical significance. AF continuous monitoring was mandatory in Atticus, and 94% of the patients received a reveal link system. In the remaining patients, the PM100 device was used. This is a two-channel cardiac event recorder, allowing for transmitting multiple ECG recordings with a duration of 40 seconds each via cellular telephone networks. APIP episodes of two minutes at least were detected in 25.6% of the patients after 12 months, with most episodes being detected early within the first three months. There was high proportion of detected AF in the aspirin arm without uh, significance, leading to a switch from aspirin to apicosabar. There was a uh, lower uh, odds for the primary uh, endpoint in AF patients treated with apixaban compared to non-AF patients, however, not reaching statistical significance. The composite of recurrent stroke and systemic embolism was not different between both arms. Most of these events occurred early within the first weeks after randomization and the index stroke. Other secondary efficacy endpoints were not significantly different between treatment arms, as was the composite endpoint of ischemic events and all-cause death. This is the other question, of course, what about the bleeding risk, uh, the downside? And you can see that there were actually no adverse sickness regarding the incidence of major and clinical relevant bleedings according to the ISDH classification. Here you can see the bleedings in details. Major bleedings occurred infrequent, and in particular, there were no cases of interseruble hemorrhage in both groups. Only the rate of minor bleedings was almost doubled with apixaban compared to aspirin. So similarly, the rate of serious adverse events were not different. In the subgroup analysis for the primary endpoint, you can see that there was a trend towards added benefit of apixaban in the elderly population, meaning age 75 years and higher. Importantly, there were no interactions on treatment effects uh, depending on the presence of PFO or the history of cancer. These factors showed a significant difference in baseline characteristics between the arms. The age effect was even more pronounced and reached statistical significance in the per protocol analysis. So this is more or less in line with uh, what was observed in the respect ESOS trial, the Davika Tran trial, showing that patients with age 75 and older seemed to benefit from dual therapy without increasing bleeding risk. So the hypothesis would be that ESOS patients benefit uh, in part because of underlying AF, which is more likely in the elderly population. So a future um, question, given the safety profile of drug therapy in the ESOS elderly patients, would be why not starting drug immediately in these patients? So in fact, in the Atticus trial, there was a strong age-AF relationship with over 40% in the elderly population in whom AF was detected by continuous monitoring. 
Major and clinical relevant bleedings, bleeding event were not increased with apixaban compared to aspirin in the elderly. Looking at the distribution and the number of risk factors that qualified for enrichment, these were well balanced between the treatment arms. The presence of PFO was often combined with other risk factors. So looking at isolated um, presence of PFO, this was not different between treatment arms. The number of risk factors significantly increased the likelihood of atrial fibrillation detection. When looking at the association of single risk factors and the probability of AF, atrial high rate episodes were the strongest predictor. Here it is important to note that these atrial high rate episodes are not comparable to the definition used in the device studies like ASSERT, NORFNET, and ATESIA. I think these trials have been discussed previously here during this meeting. During the course of the ATICOS trial, the term AHRE was most reserved to device detected subclinical AF. The term hybrid episodes used in ATICOS refers to enhanced supraventricular ectopic activity by premature atrial contractions and short atrial runs in 24 hours long term ECG. New embedded lesions were found more often in patients with AF compared to patients without, supporting the causal role of AF for cerebral embolism in this particular population. Due to the statistical power of the study, we could not detect a significant treatment effect of apixaban versus aspirin. However, new ischemic lesions, in particular new embolic lesions, were less often in the apixaban arm than in the aspirin arm. So in conclusion, articles tested the concept of DOAC versus aspirin in an ASUS population, enriched with risk factors for cardiac thromboembolism. AF was common with about 26% over one year, representing the highest detection rate in um, stroke uh, trials, uh, systematically evaluating AF with the help of uh, ECG monitoring. So Apixavan was not superior to aspirin. However, we have to account that more than every fourth patient in the aspirin arm was switched to anticoagulation. Importantly, early anticoagulation with a median of eight days after ESOS appeared to be safe, um, supporting the findings of the recently published ELAN study. Subgroup analysis indicated a lower rate of new ischemic lesions with apixaban compared to aspirin in patients aged 75 or older, thus confirming the results of the RESPECT ASUS trial. Apixaban seems to be safe in these patients, and IF detection increased with age and was particularly high in patients uh, aged 75 or older. In addition, AF detection rates increased with number of risk factors for cardiac embolism. Among those, high rate episodes were most, most predictive. Atrial fibrillation increased uh, the risk for new ischemic lesions, and the results confirm and then align with the age subgroup analysis of the respect ESOS. So as a hypothesis um, that deserves further investigation in elderly patients with at least one AF predicting factor, direct apixaban may be superior to aspirin plus continuous rhythm monitoring and switch to apixaban upon AF detection. So more analysis will follow from articles to better understand this complex condition, including a more detailed analysis of the etiology of recurrent stroke and the role of AF burden on stroke recurrence. So we are convinced that the concept of ASUS is not dead, but actually still poorly understood. So to put Atticus um, in the context of other trials investigating the role of subclinical atrial fibrillation, Atticus has the highest detected atrial fibrillation rate across cryptogenic stroke trials. So there's cumulative evidence that AF prevalence increases with continuous monitoring, and AF detection rate has been even higher in some of the device trials, including patients with cardiovascular risk factors. However, the difference is that compared to the device trials, the association of atrial fibrillation with recurrent stroke is three to five times higher. So this supports the hypothesis that the association between AF and stroke which risk is much higher and more relevant in this population. So saying this, the causal and timely relationship is still unclear since there are different patterns of atrial fibrillation depending on burden and remoteness of index stroke. And stroke itself can, of course, induce atrial fibrillation. So thus, to our opinion, it would make more sense to classify different risk groups while those showing early high-risk burden as depicted here and the other cases, and maybe AFib episodes closely 
before the stroke being at higher risk than those with early and remote low burden as proposed in this recent review. So in addition, we might need to modify our risk assessment to better discriminate high from low risk patients by implementing risk tools, including AFET burden, biomarkers, or atropathy. You will hear about this um, in the um, um, presentation by Holman on the Eclatia trial, and demographics and risk factors as suggested, for example, by the E2AD risk actors approach, a uh, different difficult work as proposed in this in this recent review. So finally, I would like to thank all collaborators for their contribution to the ethical trial, in particular Sven Poli as co-PI, the patients, investigators, the study personnel, and the industry partners, in particular BM as Pfizer and Metron. So thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Tobias Geisler. I think uh, without further ado, and to in the interest of time, we'd go straight on to the next presentation by Professor Kamel, and the probably best thing is to discuss both the studies afterwards. So, um, Professor Kamel, looking forward to your talk on Arcadia. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks so much for this uh, for this opportunity. I'm really excited for this discussion and, and to hear some thoughts about our Arcadia trial. I'm just going to do a, a, a quick summary of the trial, the rationale, the methods, and, and the findings. Here are some disclosures before I start. And the rationale for our trial was the concept of atrial cardiopathy, which is also referred to as atrial cardiomyopathy or atrial myopathy. I've, I've seen all uh, those three versions in, in various papers. But uh, the concept being that that atrial fibrillation usually does not happen in isolation, but it happens in the setting of, a, of abnormal atrial substrate. Uh, and historically, we've assumed that this abnormal atrial substrate needs to cause a fib, which then causes thromboembolism. But based on uh, some observational studies that we had done and other groups had done, we hypothesized that actually some of the underlying atrial cardiopathic changes may lead to thromboembolism. Uh, even before atrial fibrillation develops. And if that's the case, given the parallels with AFib and the proven rule of anticoagulation in AFib, we hypothesize that anticoagulation may also prevent stroke in people who have atrial cardiopathy, uh, but don't have uh, atrial fibrillation or any apparent atrial fibrillation. So that was the, the underlying hypothesis and, and rationale for the Arcadia trial. Uh, it was a multi-center uh, biomarker-driven trial, randomized, double-blind, uh, and we compared apixaban versus aspirin in patients with ESIS or, or you know, sort of uh, carefully defined cryptogenic stroke who also had evidence of atrial card cardiopathy. So, so similar to Atticus, we, we were trying to enrich the ESIS population for a certain uh, phenotype that we thought would respond better to, to um, anticoagulation. It was initiated by the investigators. We conducted it within the National Institutes of Health Stroke Net. Um, uh, where uh, we conducted it with the National Coordinating Center and the National Data Management Center, plus a Canadian uh, Coordinating Center at the Population Health Research Institute, uh, which managed the Canadian sites. It was funded by NIH. We were supported in kind by BMS Pfizer, uh, which provided the uh, study of um, apixaban and, and placebo and aspirin and placebo. And then we had ancillary funding for, uh, from Roche for the NT Pro BMP assays. And we recruited at 185 sites in the U.S. and, and StrokeNet sites and in the C Canadian Stroke Consortium. So you can see here the flow diagram of our study. So we, we um, consented, we obtained uh, written informed consent for screening from approximately 3,700 adults uh, who had uh, cryptogenic stroke and, and um, you know, did, met sort of basic inclusion criteria. Of these, about 60% were excluded because they did not meet any of the atrial cardiopathy criteria. About 40% did meet the criteria, but um, uh, about you know about 15% of the of them of the uh, cohort uh, did not meet other eligibility criteria. Uh, oftentimes, they were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation between the time of screening and the time of randomization, or they developed some other new um, exclusion criteria, maybe a clear indication for anticoagulation, et cetera. Uh, ultimately, uh, 1,015 patients out of a total sample size of 1,100 uh, were randomly assigned and started treatment. Uh, at that point, the DSMB uh, 
um, halted the study after our pre-specified interim analysis. Uh, you can see here half the group was assigned to apixaban and half to aspirin. The uh, criteria we used to define atrial cardiopathy we, were based on our pilot data uh, and, and what we thought was clinically available. So we used uh, a P wave terminal force on EKG lead V1, which is associated with underlying left atrial pathology and is pretty easy to ascertain from a 12 lead EKG. Uh, that was uh, ascertained from EKG PDFs that the sites uploaded and it was read at a central EKG lab. We used serum NT Pro BMP greater than 250, and then we used um, severe left atrial enlargement on the clinically obtained um, transthoracic echocardiograms. You can see most of the patients qualified by the nt -pro bmp and EKG criteria. Few patients had severe left atrial enlargement. Um, I wanted to show you the baseline characteristics of the patients who were randomized versus who were not in Arcadia. So overall, you know, this is this among all patients with ESIS or cryptogenic stroke, uh, the patients that were selected by our uh, biomarker criteria were a little bit older, uh, more often female, and had more heart failure, ischemic heart disease, and hypertension than the patients who did not meet the atrial cardiopathy criteria. Uh, and they more often had atrial enlargement, so about twofold higher rate of atrial enlargement. So even though we didn't enroll a lot of people uh, based just on the, the left atrial size criteria, the other two biomarkers did select out for a relatively um, uh, higher prevalence of left atrial uh, enlargement. You can see here that there were no difference between the two groups. So the DSMB halted the study for uh, futility based on the interim look. Uh, the hazard ratio was exactly one with a 95% confidence and a ranging from 0.64 to 1.55. Uh, you can see here the curves are sort of closely overlapping throughout uh, follow-up. Showing the, the results in more granular detail, you can see here again, no difference in recurrent stroke of any type, uh, no uh, apparent difference in the secondary efficacy outcomes uh, of ischemic stroke or systemic embolism or stroke or death. And then interestingly, we actually had statistically significantly fewer symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages with a pixaban than aspirin, uh, although the number of events was very small, seven with aspirin versus zero with um, a pixaban. Uh, no difference in other major hemorrhages and no difference with um, all-cause mortality, although numerically there were a few more uh, deaths with uh, in the pixaban group. We also looked at subgroups, and especially we were very interested in this age subgroup. We, we actually added it to our statistical analysis plan after um, uh, hearing from the, the Atticus investigators at ISC, uh, the International Stroke Conference, a couple of years ago, seeing that result published. But in our study, we did not see any interaction or apparent trend um, in the older than 75 versus younger than 75 subgroups. And they're really, after Bonferroni adjustment, there were no differences in, in between, you know, with um, treatment effect across the seven pre-specified subgroups that we had. So, so as we were thinking about our results, one, one question we had is, you know, were our atrial cardiopathy criteria actually identifying, you know, atrial cardiopathy. Uh, we based it on pilot data, but, um, uh, you know, that was one hypothesis. Maybe our biomarkers just were not that good. So we thought we could interrogate that a little bit by looking at the association between the biomarkers and subsequent atrial fibrillation in Arcadia, uh, because, you know, we think of AFib as like, as the hallmark, right? Uh, the criterion for, for uh, atrial cardiopathy. And so you can see that in, in unadjusted models, if you just look at the uh, biomarker in isolation, all three of our biomarkers were in model one were associated with uh, the subsequent detection of AFib. So at the time of screening, patients could not have atrial fibrillation, but oftentimes after we screened them, they went on and developed AFib either before or after randomization. And you can see that all the... the uh, all the markers were associated. NT pro BMP, the most strongly associated, and P wave terminal force, the least strongly associated. And then in a fully adjusted model, model three, uh, where we included all three models plus demographics and comorbidities, uh, 
uh, you can see the anti pro BMP and, and left atrial dimension remain associated with, with um, future uh, atrial fibrillation. And if you look at the predictive um, sort of the discrimination of these biomarkers, you can see that the three biomarkers together, the C statistic was 0.82. Uh, and, and this seems to be mostly being driven by anti pro BMP with weaker prediction coming from left atrial size and very weak prediction from P wave terminal force. So in aggregate, our biomarkers were associated with and predictive of AFib, although obviously not, not perfectly so. Um, so at this point, you know, as we think about the possible reasons, uh, we think that one, uh, it may be just, just that the hypothesis was incorrect, right? That, it, that in order to see a benefit from anticoagulation, you, ha you, you have to have atrial cardiopathy that's severe enough to have AFib and that you need the AFib itself to cause, you know, that, that, that increased thromboembolic risk. And in our trial, the patients with AFib were, prob were probably pretty reliably screened out with, with a lot of heart rhythm monitoring um, at our sites. And, and, and at the same time, we think there's probably a lot of competing risk of recurrent stroke from atherosclerosis. We're learning more and more about the role of non-obstructive or non-stenosing atherosclerotic plaque in, in what we think is cryptogenic stroke. Uh, and so that might be a, a, a big part of this story as well. Our conclusions for now is that, you know, obviously more research is needed, but AFib seems to be, uh, seems still to be the king, you know, and it remains the hallmark of atrial cardiopathy and it's the best available biomarker that we have of left atrial thromboembolic risk and its response to, to anticoagulation. Well, thank you so much. That was also very, very interesting and fascinating looking into the details from your side. Um, Christoph Kleinschnitz will now start the discussion. I'm very happy for the first uh, to see the first questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Good evening to all of you. So first of all, yeah, congratulations to both of you, Tobias and Human. Great studies, great publications, and a huge effort. Um, however, still fr from a clinical standpoint, maybe, or obviously, some some open questions still remain. Maybe I can start with a question for Tobias. So, Tobias. Wouldn't you have even expect an even higher rate of atrial fibrillation of atrial fibrillation in your enriched population? I mean, you found twenty five percent, which is considerably high already. But given the fact that you, yeah, did so much effort and performed so much effort to really, you know, um, yeah, select or pre specify the right patients, um, did this meet your expectation and might might an even higher rate of AFib or detection of AFib might have led to, to other results. What what is your what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yes, that's the first important uh, point. So uh, actually we we had a preliminary study um, before that uh, kind of registry where we used actually the same or similar criteria for enrichment and then we found about 30% of, of mm. patients. So so actually, our um, sample size and power calculation were based on this assumption. So um, now we ended up in a little lower rate yeah. of atrial fibrillation. Um, but of course, I mean, time has changed since then. So um, actually, there's more um, uh, aggressive um, screening for atrial fibrillation in the stroke units. So we really um, rule out uh, many of these patients who were then not eligible for, yeah. for Atticus. Uh, that, that that might be a reason uh, why we have um, a, a different population here with lower risk for um, clinical uh, relevant uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, and then, of course, it's an issue of, 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 of the follow-up. So maybe if we look, of course, for, for, for long follow-up, we will end up in a, in a, in a higher rate of atrial fibrillation, although, yeah. as I showed, um, most of the atrial fibrillation episodes are cured, are cured very early. Mm. So I, I'm really keen to see your additional analysis on on um yeah alternative reasons for for stroke uh, if i understood this correctly this will um yeah come out in due course you're currently analyzing the data set and it will be interesting to see what additional reasons you you're about to find apart from uh, atrial fibrillation so thank you another question to whom and so i very much like this concept of of atrial um yeah, pathology or cardiopathology, um, because if it 
turns out to be clinically important, it would be some sort of super early, you know, surrogate, um, surrogate and risk factor of ischemic stroke. Um, now this study was neutral in a way, but but anyway, um, let's pretend that um, you would have, or th there was there was some difference in your study or maybe in future studies, from from a practical standpoint, how how you know how much effort one has to put into this concept and how much work is needed when when i think of the collaboration between neuro neurologists and cardiologists to detect this hyper and super early stages of of yeah pre-atrial fibrillation i i'm i'm considering the diagnostic workup so uh, you mentioned that the values you included and the parameters you included were some sort of basic parameters like BNP and, and some ECG um, analysis. But uh, would this be feasible in, you know, everyday clinical routine? Or would this increase, you know, the workload for obviously for the cardiologist, you know, to to identify such super early stages and risk factors of, of uh, embolic stroke? Yeah, no, that's a really, yeah, it's a great question is, is, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things there. What, the biggest, the biggest issue is this, this, you know, it's a concept, right? This concept of atrial cardio, uh, cardiomyopathy. There was a, a nice European heart rhythm, um, association, like position statement back in 2017 that tried to give a definition, but it, it ends up being kind of circular, you know, it's that, that, yeah. that, um, it's any set of abnormalities that have clinically relevant uh, uh, effects, but it's hard to study the clinically relevant effects if you don't have a definition of the of the of the entity itself, right? And um, that's one of the things we struggled with in Arcadia. I think the field is struggling with uh, AFib. I think because of clinical experience, uh, it, it's it's a you know it was noticed long long ago that patients who have this finding on EKG. Yeah. Uh, are a much higher risk of stroke. And it's a very relatively straightforward diagnostic marker. To try to come up with a, a, um, a di diagnostic, diagnostic marker that precedes AFib is much more challenging because there's no one thing that stands out as the best uh, marker. And um, it makes it really hard. It makes it hard in clinical practice, but also makes it hard in research to try yeah. to, to try to define this entity. If I think if you know Arcadia or similar tribe were positive, um, it, there would be definitely challenges in terms of translating that into clinical practice, right? Um, uh, for example, in our trial, NT pro BNT, I think is re would have been reasonably easy to translate. Yeah. Although not every hospital has that specific assay, right? Sometimes they have just N they just have BNP. Yeah. Uh, and then the EKG one would be challenging because the the EKG machines don't read it out. They could. Yeah. They could be programmed to read that, but they don't, um, and so that you know that would be challenging. Uh, currently, there's the Moses trial that's happening in Switzerland, I believe, uh, with with Mira Catan. They're using um, mid-regional uh, atrial natriuretic peptide MR pro ANP. Again, an assay that's available, but I don't know how widely available it is. If that trial's positive, you know, we we'd have to figure out how to um, how to do that. And and even let's say let's say um, Moses is positive. You know, yes, you could use that to then treat people who meet the MR, you know, pro ANP threshold. But yeah. would would you stop monitoring the people who don't meet that threshold for AFib and treat them if they have AFib, right? So it, so it doesn't necessarily automatically. You can't switch from the current heart rhythm monitoring strategy completely to this other strategy, right? And so that's one challenge. And then I think the other challenge is like some of the diagnostic modalities for atrial yeah. you know, cardiopathy like cardiac MRI yeah. I'm not sure are ever going to be feasible in a stroke population right if you if you can't hold your breath and follow command you know follow instructions etc so yeah very challenging topic yeah maybe another question to all of you so renal function and the risk of atrial fibrillation of course is also always a, a, a challenging pro problem and it's a it's a practical problem because we see this every day in our stroke units and since we also do have new nephrologists here in our round did did you see i guess not but did you see in any interactions of your results with 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 renal function or was it totally silent and maybe how do the nephrologists in our round interpret these findings <laughs> 
So from my side, we of course um, apply the dose reduction criteria in, in patients with renal failure. So actually, we, we didn't see any interaction in, in, in Atticus uh, with regard to the primary endpoint, but uh, neither um, bleeding events. Yeah, that's a great question. We we also apply the standard dose, but I don't I don't believe we've checked for an interaction with renal function yet. So that's that's a good point. We should we should check for that. So maybe the kidney doctor's standpoint. So we generally recommend as a rule of thumb, maybe that down to a GFR of 30, we should just apply the regular recommendations from cardiology and neurology. So we don't have really to do anything different. Surely we have to change the dosage following the recommendations, but whether to give or not to give anticoagulation would just follow the general rules. When it comes down to poor kidney function and particularly to dialysis patients, then we are really lost. So we don't know anything. We would surely in secondary prevention follow general recommendations to give anticoagulation. But for all other questions, we found that those people who receive anticoagulation have a tremendously high bleeding rate. And therefore, we are very reluctant really to give these people anticoagulation. Yeah. Uh, Tobias, maybe another question. So you had this really innovative endpoint of MRI, so imaging endpoint actually, which which was different from all the other uh, ESO studies. Um, maybe for our audience, um, how, how often did you perform this MRI? Or in other words, could it be that you have missed some of your index events? Uh, I guess you performed DWI and flare imaging or? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. W, uh, I am um, flare imaging um, uh, at optimal uh, at uh, at the baseline. So of course at baseline, we, we had an index uh, MRI and then a 12 month MRI. And then also an additional MRI in those patients uh, in whom uh, atrial fibrillation was detected yep. during the course of a trial. So we are now still analyzing all these data, whether there are any changes um, um, with regard to the on-treatment period of uh, aspirin versus a pixel bond. Um, but actually in one third of the patient, one additional MRI was performed uh, in addition to the 12-month uh, endpoint MRI. And we had neurologist um, uh, raters, uh, different ones, and then we also uh, calculated the interrate um, observer um, variability, um, which was which was uh, yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. So, but still, Tobias, you are you are very positive in terms of ESOs. You you say that the entire concept is not dead yet. So maybe we can have a brief outlook with with novel anticoagulants appearing, you know, on the horizon. We all know that. The first study in terms of AFib and stroke prevention with factor 11 inhibitor uh, asyndexian was negative, but but still, any any guesses here or, or or gut feelings that with the development of of novel anticoagulants, um, this ESOS concept should be reinvestigated and um, yeah, you know, more res research uh, efforts should be put on, or do you think in general it remains a very complicated and, and, and critical population, which is in a way not easy to treat when it comes to blood thinners. I mean, no, I think we have not so bad data actually with regard to bleeding risk reduction with a pixel in both of these trials, Atticus and, and Atradi also. And I'm, I'm quite astonished by the low intracranial bleeding rates with a pixel um, compared to aspirin in the Arcadia trial. So from a safety uh, point, I mean, uh, why not um, using a pixel barn in, in this in this um, uh, patient population from the very beginning. So I'm not sure whether the novel uh, factor 10 uh, 11 inhibitors will, can really compete uh, against this. Uh, so it will be a balance between efficacy uh, and, and safety. But on the safety side, I'm, I'm, I'm not so convinced. I mean, that's uh, the holy grail, actually, that you try to uh, additionally reduce bleeding with Mavexian or Anzindexian compared to Ap Apixaban. Uh, it's a very strong competitor to my point of view in these in these trials. So, so we will have to see what, what they do on the terms of, of bleeding events. So on the, on the side of efficacy, it is um, it is not quite clear if we have the, the right doses of these factor 11 inhibitors in the trials. So I think that was also a problem with as Azondexian um, in the um, um, uh, Oceanic uh, program. 
Uh, so probably um, the change of APTT was too low and then those was actually too low with azonlexion. So this will be on the efficacy side, will be a critical point with dosing uh, also in the stroke population. So we will have to see what, what these trials uh, will bring. Uh, the the Brexia, uh, AF and stroke trials are still going on. So we, it will be quite uh, exciting. Any additional comment here, Human, from your side? No, I just a full disclosure. I'm on the executive committee for the the Labrexia AF trial, and and uh, I I completely agree um, that it, they're potentially very exciting, but we we have to see. I think the the findings from Oceanic AF were um, uh, pretty pretty sobering. You know, yeah. the the Asindexian, uh being not as effective as as a uh, uh, DOAX. So um, I think the, I think the jury's still out. We'll have to see. Uh, it, do, it does. I mean, I think for a secondary pr uh, prevention perspective, I agree that it's kind of shocking how safe Apixaban ended up mm -hmm. being in these two trials. And um, it, it, it's it's sort of it's the question of, you know, why wasn't there efficacy? It certainly wasn't a safety issue. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it, it's just in, it's just innately unsatisfying to have all these strokes where we don't know the cause. So I think people are going to continue to investigate and chip away try yeah. to better understand this. Uh, but, you know, how exactly it'll play out and when we're going to get the therapeutic advances, uh, I think remains to be seen. There's also so much excitement with, you know, these GLP-1 uh, and, you know, agonists and like weight loss drugs and just general vascular risk factor modification and how that ultimately affects the whole landscape of secondary stroke prevention. Um, so it's it's very much a moving target, I think. If you, yeah. if you must specifically focus on cryptogenic stroke and ESIS. Yeah. So so maybe some final comments on, on, on the older stroke patients. Of course, we as a strokeologists and neurologists, we are very much interested in, in elderly stroke patients because that's our daily business. Um, the, the trends are interesting, right? So there's a trend towards positive findings in, in your studies, at least in Tobias' study. Atticus trial in, in, in older patients, and we have seen this from, from, from other trials as well. Um, Tobias in Tübingen, you are a neurologist. What, what, what do they do? Do they, do they, do they apply anticoagulants to, um, let's say, 75 plus aged um, stroke patients with ESOS or not yet, still on, 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 on aspirin? I mean, this is still off label, so um, sure. actually you have to identify atrial fibrillation in these patients. But now, with the results of the Atticus trial, of course, we more intensively screen, in particular this patient population. Uh, I tried to show you these um, um, parameters, the predictors of atrial fibrillation, like um, um, premature atrial contractions in the 24 hours long term ECG. That could be a, probably a marker where we look quite intensely for atrial fibrillation. Uh, in particular, an elderly patient, and then I think it's reasonable to start anticoagulation very early in these patients. Yep. So now I think we have enough evidence that that it's it's a safe therapy um, um, in in our elderly patients, not only from the stroke trials but also from the AFib trials, from the subgroup analysis. We have um, robust evidence, I think, that that uh, drug therapy is is safe. And now we have also with the Elan study. I think we have evidence that we can start early with anticoagulation um, after stroke. Um, so I think um, we should be um, uh, we should uh, be um, more risky actually in this in this mm. patient population. Mm. I have one one more question that I find kind of kind of burning. If if patient selection is the key, and I think we agree on that, um, what what's your thoughts on the future concerning artificial intelligence? I mean, we have ECGs now that can just by heart rate variability or by the you know shape of P P wave and all these kind of things. They're not into clinical daily business yet, but you can actually predict atrial fibrillation possibly, and maybe five years from now we'll be much further. Would that be an option without MRI, without ILR, without all these things to predict patient selection better? That's a good idea, and uh, of course we we would be very interested in that we we have uh, quite a lot of uh, um, ECGs archived with an Atticus uh, baseline ECGs, and uh, of course we have. Uh, wealth of um, um, ECGs uh, from the continuous uh, monitoring. So actually we could correlate baseline ECGs um, with uh, um, AI detection and, and the um, actual detection of atrial fibrillation. So that's a very interesting question. And we, uh, we're looking into the data and try to apply um, AI models in, in, in our trial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But it's a yeah, good, I, very good I, comment, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's very exciting. We've talked about it internally in the, the Arcadia team. I, I think one, one sort of uh, concern or at least need for more data is that I, from what I've seen, a lot of the prediction models, at least that I've seen, took, you know, people who probably had AFib at that, you know, like either they had passed AFib or uh, so you're, 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 you're including a lot of EKGs of patients um, who have AFib, proximal AFib, and they're just in sinus rhythm at that time. So that's a more ex sort of uh, extreme end of the spectrum of atrial cardiopathy, right? If you're truly trying to, you know, predict future AFib, someone who's going to develop AFib like six months or a year later, presumably that's like a less, that's a much harder prediction um, task, I think. So I think it still remains to be determined if these these um, algorithms are going to be good enough to be able to predict who's going to benefit from anticoagulation, but it's definitely something that should be explored. I agree there. It's very exciting. Yeah, so thank you very much to all of you. I guess this was a great and interesting discussion underlining you know the, the the great need for collaboration between neurologists and cardiologists and also kidney doctors uh, in particular in stroke care so are there any additional comments from from our hosts here stefan uh, and gunnar or are you satisfied with with this with maybe this just recording one here? final question uh, yeah. Does anybody ever had the idea to apply occluders in these patients who are not yet diagnosed with atrial fibrillation? Coming back to the idea that even without atrial fibrillation, uh, this may be a potential protection against stroke. I, I've talked about this with Jeff Healy. Um, I don't know if anyone planned to do this uh, with a percutaneous approach, but I, I believe there's at least one um, randomized trial in cardiothoracic surgery where they're they're looking at you know surgical left atrial appendage um, occlusion or you know uh, clipping whatever you, you term it in people who don't have a fib they just have risk factors for AFib. so I think that'll actually be a really nice kind of like almost pure um, uh, uh, test of that concept uh, of of you know, left atrial appendage uh, occlusion or, or uh, you know, exclusion from the circulation and people who don't have apparent AFib. Um, so that, that'll that be neat to see. Yeah, but here again, it's it's a question of how you really um, define atrial party and those patients if they have no uh, atrial fibrillation. So um, yeah, that will be uh, quite an adventurous study. But uh... Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they're doing it because you know the surgeon's already in there, and so they don't think it's it's and and yeah, they're not I they're agree. not basing yeah. it on left atrial morphology. I think they're just literally looking at like um, vascular risk factors. If you have a high enough chance to vascular, don't I, I may be wrong on some of the details. Yeah, but but if they are right operating any way for mitral surgery, for example, then right. it makes sense. Yeah. And I think the guidelines are very open to that uh, left atrial appendage closure, a surgical one. But if you do a separate approach, interventional approach, right. and then you're right. Uh, which is not unrisky, so you have you have some complications there. I think it's it's difficult. Yeah, I, I fully agree. From a neurologist perspective, at this stage, I would I would be very reluctant now, and uh, I would also uh, you know um, yeah put my cards into future you know ESA studies and and anticoagulation studies and a better characterization of the stroke subgroups rather than you know doing such um, yeah. <laughs> risky things at, at, at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, we, we've really touched uh, all kinds of diagnostic and uh, therapeutic approaches. Thank you so much, um, all of you, Tobias Geisler, Human Kamel, for this uh, great discussion, uh, Christoph Kleinschnitz, for leading, leading the discussion and the interesting thoughts on the studies. I think, thank you for the studies also for conducting your great research. We're looking very much forward to, to reading and seeing more of you. And uh, let's see what the field brings in the years to come. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much. You.